Hello everyone. In this recording, chapter 10, we are going to take a closer look at cost behaviors. So with cost behaviors, we are actually taking a, the reason why it's important. Let me back up. The reason why it's important to understand how costs behave is because it will help us greatly improve our budgeting practices in trying to understand the total costs based on our activity levels. That's the bottom line. So that is the reason why we want to understand how costs behave. Um, certainly the cost function is, is the math in describing how a cost will change with changes in the le level of activities. So as an example, if I want to try to budget how much my cost would be if I made 2 units or 20 units or 200 units or 2,000 units or 200,000 units or 2 million units, I can do so if I understand how costs behave. If I don't understand how the costs behave, this budgeting practice is going to be nearly impossible. So costs behave um, approximately in a linear cost function within what we call the relevant range. The relevant range is obviously uh, the range where the cost will behave a certain way. Once we get out of that range, um, then the, there's going to be a jump in cost for whatever reason. So there are really two ways, actually three ways, in which a cost can behave. The first is called a variable cost. And a variable cost per unit will always remain the same within the relevant range. However, the total variable costs will increase or decrease based on increases or decreases in total production. Fixed costs, on the other hand, will always remain the same in total, but they will be uh, they will change per unit based on changes in activity. As an example, as activity increases, the cost per unit will decrease and vice versa. And a mixed cost is something that is partly fixed and partly variable. So let me give you an example before we move on to the next slide. Let's say we have a warehouse where we are making, um, uh, we're making uh, baseball gloves. All right, we've got the leather, we've got uh, basically all of the materials we need to make the baseball gloves. And I said that the cost of um, the cost of the actual leather is that a variable cost or a fixed cost? Well, the answer you should probably be coming up with it's a variable cost because as we make more baseball gloves, the total variable costs for the leather will increase as, as activity increases and it will decrease as activity decreases. But what will remain the same is the total leather cost per glove, right? That's the total, the total variable cost per unit will always remain the same, but the totals were changed based on activity. Now, what about a fixed cost in this situation? A fixed cost would be, let me give you an example, a maintenance supervisor that is on a set salary. Well, it doesn't matter how many baseball gloves we make. We can make one, we can make a million. As long as we're, we're within that relevant range, that fixed cost is the same, his salary. Let's say his salary is $80,000 for the year. Well, if we make one glove, his fixed cost, fixed cost per unit is 80000 if we make 80,000 baseball gloves, the fixed cost per unit is a dollar. So you can see how they behave. They behave very differently. Variable costs in total will change as activity changes, but the per unit will remain the same. Fixed costs will remain the same in total, but will change based on activity levels. And a mixed cost is something that is both. It's got a fi fixed and a variable component. And uh, this is the formula we're going to use, y equals a plus bx. What does this mean? y represents the total cost, 
A is going to represent the fixed cost. And B is going to represent the variable cost per unit. And X is going to represent the number of units. So Y is the total cost. A is the fixed cost. B is the variable cost per unit. X is the number of units. This formula will help us as we determine total costs on a go-forward basis. And we can see um, we've got uh, the accounting term over here on the left. And for those of you that have taken the statistics course, you can see the comparison in your statistics course. OK, so here are our three different graph graphics to show us what a variable cost looks like, a fixed cost, and a mixed cost. So a variable cost, as you can see, panel A on the left, um, towards the bottom is the number of hours used, and the y-axis is the actual total cost. So as we actually use zero hours, there's zero cost. But as we use different hours, our total cost is going to increase from there. That's the variable cost. A fixed cost, you can see it doesn't matter how many hours we, we use. We can use zero hours, 4,000 hours, 8,000 hours, what have you. You can see the cost, which is representative of the green line. The cost is the same, $1,000. So the total cost is the same, regardless of the activity level. And a mixed cost is partly fixed and partly variable. We can see here that it intercepts at the total cost line is going to intercept at the y-axis at the $300 mark. The $300 represents the fixed cost. And then as it increases, the difference between the fixed cost line and the green line, that difference is considered the variable cost. All right, so panel A is a variable cost where there is absolutely no fixed. Panel B is a fixed cost where you can see the cost is exactly the same. Regardless of activity, it doesn't change. It's a straight parallel line. And a mixed cost doesn't start at the zero intercept. It actually starts at, in this case, the $300 intercept because that represents the fixed piece. And then it goes up from there with the mixed part of it. All right, so certainly um, in order to classify our costs, uh, first we need to, uh, and we need to basically get a better understanding of budgeting for these costs, uh, we need to choose our cost object. And we need to choose our time horizon. The longer the period we go out, the more likely a cost will be variable because ultimately all costs are going to change. So the example I gave before, the supervisor's salary of $80,000 a year, we're going to get to a point where we're making so many units that we either need to expand our warehouse or we need to hire a, another supervisor for another $80,000. So ultimately, these costs aren't going to stay fixed forever. That's what I mean when I talk about the relevant range all right, for that one warehouse, that one opportunity to hire one supervisor. But if we get to a point where our activity is so much higher, we are in a different relevant range. OK, um, there is a cause and effect criterion here. Um, what is the cause and effect? So as an example, as we make more baseball gloves, the effect is we need to use more leather. All right. So this is the cause and effect relationships that we're trying to figure out as we are trying to develop our budgets. OK. Um, so the first part of this, before we start to you know, understand our costs and how they work is we need to correctly identify a cost driver. And remember what the cost drivers are. The cost drivers are basically there to, uh, to understand how the costs change. So based on a particular unit, example, making uh, a baseball glove, we will understand what costs are driven from that particular cost driver, the baseball glove. All right. And as we said, costs may seem like they're fixed in the short run, but as we go out in a longer term period, uh, ultimately everything will be somewhat variable. Um, there are four methods that people typically use 
uh, for estimating costs. And let's kind of talk about these. Um, number one, the industrial engineering method. Um, that's when we're actually going to analyze the relationships between the inputs and the outputs. So as an example, um, as an example, if we are making, uh, let me see, we are making a rug. All right. So when we make a rug, we basically have the inputs of cotton, wool, dyes. Um, we have direct labor. We have machine time. We have power, the utilities, the electrical. Those are all the inputs into making a rug. So we need materials. We need labor. Uh, we have overhead. So those are the inputs. And the output is basically square yards of carpet. All right. So we're going to estimate by looking at the relationship between all these inputs and outputs. It is very time consuming, although it's very thorough, it's very detailed. Uh, a lot of contracts will require, at least government contracts will require this industrial engineering method. By the way, it's also called the work measurement method. Okay, so this is something that is very time consuming, but certainly um, uh, it gives you a very good uh, estimate of, of your costs. Um, sometimes it's too costly to implement because it is very time consuming. The second method is typically called the conference method. The conference method um, basically estimates costs on the basis of analysis and opinions about costs and their drivers. As an example, you are going to get all departments together to try to come up with your cost estimates. Um, and so this rug company that I've been talking about, they may gather opinions from different supervisors, from production engineers, um, you know, and whatnot, all the groups combined to try to develop cost estimates. The accuracy may not necessarily be there. Of course, it depends on the, the skill of the people providing the inputs. Uh, so this is something that may not be the best method to use. And then, of course, number three, we have the account analysis method. This is going to estimate costs based on classifying very various cost accounts as variable, fixed, or mixed. Uh, typically, managers will use qualitative rather than quantitative analysis when making these cost classification decisions. And this is something that would work out pretty well. Uh, so certainly it's, it's widely used. Um, it's pretty accurate. It's cost effective, which is different than what we were talking about earlier with the industrial engineering method. So this is something that, uh, uh, you know, when we analyze each account and we try to break down that cost as fixed, mixed, or variable, all right, and trying to develop, uh, you know, qualitative analysis for each of them works out pretty well. And then, of course, we have the quantitative analysis method, where we will use that mathematical formula that I showed you before. The results are very objective, all right? That is very different than the account analysis method that I just talked about. With the account analysis method, we're using a lot of qualitative analysis instead of quantitative. So with the account analysis, it could be subjective. But with quantitative, we're just using the raw numbers. It's very objective. All right. So certainly the quantitative analysis could be used as well because it takes a lot of the subjectivity out of it. And um, we would use that method, those, the formula method that I was telling you about earlier. Now, there are two basic types of quantitative analysis. Uh, the first one I'm going to walk through with you so you understand how it works. And that is typically called the high-low method. And with the high-low method, as the name would uh, lead you to believe, um, we are going to look at a bunch of data for a given period for a particular cost. And let's say we're looking at uh, six months of data. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the high month of data and the low month of data, and we are going to compare the two. How much was the total cost at the high level 
versus the low med low metal uh, low level and the same thing with the cost driver what was the high cost driver and what was the low example and by the way what we're doing here is we are analyzing mixed cost to try to determine out of the mixed cost how much of the how much of it is fixed and how much is variable so as an example let's take uh, we're trying to figure out indirect labor uh, which we know is is not exactly fixed and it's not exactly variable, so we know it's mixed. But we're trying to figure out what is the fixed piece of this and what is the variable piece of this. So if I know the cost driver for indirect labor is machine hours, that's what actually uh, makes the uh, the indirect labor increase or decrease based on the number of machine hours. So there's your cost driver. We're going to take a look at the high uh, machine hours and the low machine hours and compare the two so let's say for a particular period whether we're looking at six months of data eight months of data ten months of data twelve months what have you if we look at that data and we saw at the high activity level um, we used a hundred hours and we know our total cost was 2500 bucks at that high level and the low level out of everything we're looking at, the lowest level was 80 machine hours, and we see the total cost is $2,100. We are going to use our formula to figure out the high, I'm sorry, the fixed and the variable pieces. So the numerator in our example, the numerator is going to be the high minus the low in total costs. So 2,500 minus 2,100, the high costs minus the low cost divided by, and the denominator is going to be the high um, cost driver minus the low, so 100 hours minus 80. When you do the math, it's 400 is your numerator, divided by 20, which is your denominator. That works out to $20. You know what this $20 is? This is our variable cost per unit. And so what we could do is we can use our formula, total costs minus Variable cost equals fixed. At the high level, the total cost was 2500 minus the variable we know is $20 per unit. The 20 is what we figured out on the past slide, times the 100 hours. That works out to $500. You can check yourself again by plugging in the $20 in the low level. The low level total was 2100 minus the variable. $20 per unit times 80. And if you do the math, you get the $500 is your fixed cost. All right, so Y equals A plus BX. And we will utilize that using this high-low method to have an idea. And now that we've broken out our mixed cost, we know how much of it is fixed. We can now budget in the future if we do, well, what if, what if, and this is the what if, what if we had 100 hours as the level of activity? Well, we know the total cost is going to be the fixed piece, which is 500 plus $20 times 120. 20 is the cost per unit times if we're, or what if statement is 120. So we can estimate, now that we've used the high-low method, we've estimated that at a level of 120 hours, our total cost is going to be 2,900. Once again, we would not be able to do this if we did not understand how costs behave. So cost behavior is the key to all of this. And then, of course, we have regression analysis. Regression analysis is more accurate than the high-low method because the regression equation estimates cost using information from all observations, not just the high and the low, which is two observations. So with regression analysis, it's, it's more of a statistical method. Um, so certainly we're going to take a look and analyze all of the operations, all of the observations, excuse me, not just two, which is the high and the low. All right, so regression analysis certainly is very, um, very useful. Okay, um, now... In order for any of this to work, we got to make sure that we're choosing the cost drivers correctly. We really truly need to understand how costs react to certain drivers. 
So we need to make sure that we determine the best cost driver. We have to have, in, in order to do that, we need to have a good understanding of our operations. All right, and so certainly we can see here um, how a company would go about choosing cost drivers. It's economically plausible, there is a good fit, and there's a significance of the independent variable. Okay, now identifying, this is so critically important because if we identify the wrong drivers, um, it's going to lead to bad budgets. It's going to lead management to make incorrect decisions ultimately. And that could, could lead to failure of the company. So we need to make sure the cost drivers are, are correctly chosen. Estimating cost drivers, it doesn't matter if we're using a simple costing system or an activity-based costing system, right? ABC, we've looked at both of these simple costing systems, activity-based costing systems. So certainly um, estimating cost drivers, it doesn't differ with simple costing systems. Ultimately, we need to choose the right uh, cost drivers so we can accurately predict future costs based on different activity levels. Okay, so what we're going to talk about here in the next example is um, ultimately there's a learning curve involved when we continuously make a product. There are two learning curves that we are going to discuss now. And basically, those two learning curves are, number one, the cumulative average time learning model. And the second one is called the incremental unit time learning model. And so companies would need to choose when they are actually budgeting in the future and as their company grows, and as their manufacturing actually doubles, every time it doubles, what is going to happen with the time involved with making a product? And so a company can analyze in both of these ways. They would need to choose what is better for them, the cumulative average time learning model or the incremental unit time learning model uh, to determine which works better for or what fits their company better when they are trying to analyze costs in the future okay as activity increases so the first one which is the first bullet point here the cumulative average time learning model basically what happens is every time the cumulative quantity of units that we're producing doubles the cumulative the cumulative average time per unit will decline by a constant percentage. Let me show you how this works. So over here we have the Excel spreadsheet. In column A of the Excel spreadsheet, we have the cumulative number of units that we are making. So as an example, when we make one unit, the cumulative um, labor hours is 100. Cumulative average is 100. Now, when we make two, what's happening? When we go from one to two, what are we doing? We are doubling the amount of units we are making. So when we double the amount of units we are making, our cumulative average is going to go down by 80%. Is going to, is going to go down um, in increments of 80%. So this is an 80% learning curve. So it took 100 to make one. So when we double from one to two, it's going to go from 100 times the 80% or 80. Now when we double two, what do we get to? Four. So at two, we made, it was 80 was our average labor hours to make one. So 80 times 80%, 80%, 0.8, 64. What's double four? Eight. And when we make eight, we're going to take 64 times 0.8, or 51.2 hours. And then when we double 8, what do we get to? 16. And when we make 16, what do we got? 51.2 times 0.8.
So you can see when we made one, it averaged 100 hours to make one. By the time we were making 16 units, our average was 40.96 labor hours. The cumulative is going to be the number of units times our average time. So as an example, when we made one, one times 100 is 100. Okay? And when we made 16, 16 times 40.96 equals 655.36. And this last column, column E, you can see is basically um, the time to make the, the next unit. So as an example, we made one, it was 100 hours. When we made two, um, the cumulative was 160. So when we go from 100 to 160, the next unit was 60. The next time, to make three of them, three times 70.21, you get 210.63. So to make the third one is 210.63 minus 160 is 50.63. You can see by the time we make our 16th, we're down to 28. So even though the average is 40.96 per unit, by the time we're making our 16th unit, we're down to 28 hours. All right, so we are learning as we move along. That is the cumulative average time learning model. Now, the next model that could be used when we analyze future activity levels is called the incremental unit time learning model. Let me go back a couple of slides so you can see what this is called. The incremental time, the incremental unit time learning model is when the incremental time to make the next unit declines by a constant percentage every time we double. So with the cumulative average time learning model, every time the number of units doubled, the cumulative average time went down. All right. With the incremental unit time learning model, which is the same 16 units, to make the first one is still the same 100. But as we double, what's happening is we are seeing that the, yeah, we're seeing the same, you know, as we double, the individual time is going to keep going down by 80%, you know, multiplied by 80%. So when we double from 1 to 2, 100 times 80% or 0.80, we double again to 4. We get 80 times 0 0.8, 64, just like we explained last time. But the cumulative is going to be to time to, the time to take 1, which is 100, plus the time to make the second one, 80. The total is going to be 180. In the prior chart, we saw that the cumulative after 2 was 160. All right, because we were taking the average. We were taking the average of the two. You can see 2 times 80 or 160. But here we are taking the first one plus the second one is 180, plus the third one, 250.21, plus the fourth one, 314. If we do it this way and analyze this way, by the time we have made 16, what is our cumulative labor hours? 892.01 divided by 16, that's an average of 55.75. That's a little different than we used the earlier learning curve where our total to make 16 was 655 hours. Now, which best represents your organization? That's something you need to decide which method um, we would use, the cumulative average time learning model or the incremental unit time learning model, where incrementally it's going to go down, all right? But you can see if we use this, the number of hours is certainly going to be budgeted for a lot higher. Whatever fits your company better, this is something that you would need to decide. And so you can see here's a graphical explanation of the first one, which was cumulative average time per unit, um, which... Um, Cumulative average time per unit was the red line. The incremental unit time learning model is, is the blue line. So you can see, as we saw, um, as we saw earlier, um, takes more time all right, to do you know, utilizing this incremental unit time model. That's why the, the line is a little bit higher. You can see the learning curve ultimately is going to make the lines go down ever so slightly as we go on and on and on. 
So that's a good thing. The more you learn, the more you make, the more you learn about the process. Think about yourself. When you do something in the begin in the beginning, when you're learning something, you go very slow. All right. Think about when you, um, I don't know, first learned to drive a car. You were very slow. You weren't really sure of yourself when you got to the red light, making the left-hand turn, what have you, parking. Now some of you can do this blindfolded. Not that I want you to drive blindfolded, but you get my point. You get more confident. There are hopefully less mistakes. Um, same thing if you watch a baby learn how to walk, right? They get more confident in it. And certainly, um, certainly they can make less mistakes as they as they get older and older and older with their walking, and then the same thing with their spelling and their math and and whatnot. So you get my point. That's what's going on here. As we do something more and more, uh, we make less and less mistakes, and we can do it in a quicker time. That's what these models are saying. Okay. And uh, this is if our labor hours. Um, we were charging fifty dollars per labor hours, and uh, this was the first. Uh, this was the first graph when we were using the cumulative average time learning model. By the time we make sixteen units, we were at forty point nine six average labor hours, and we made total six hundred fifty five point three six labor hours. And so that's here sixteen units. Forty point nine six is the average. Six. 55.36. If you take the 655.36 cumulative hours times $50 per labor hour, this would be our total cost, 32,768. So we can predict future costs based on these uh, learning curves. It's very important to understand that with learning curves, um, it's going to take longer in the beginning, but as we make more, it's going to cost us a little bit less money because it will take less time to make a particular unit. So learning curves should certainly be built into the budgeting process.